Have you ever wanted to learn how to do addition on the Japanese Soroban Abacus? Well, if so, today is your lucky day. Hi there, I'm Joe Van Cleve, and I'm going to teach you in this one video everything you need to know to do addition on the Japanese Soroban. Stay tuned. For the purposes of this video today, I'm going to be using this teacher's abacus. Uh, this is a little bit larger in size bead-wise than what you would actually use for an individual's purpose, but uh, these teaching abacuses, the beads will stay up when you move them. They don't fall back down because the little plastic beads have a little grippy thing that inside of it that grips the plastic rod. So we're going to use a teaching abacus today. You first need to know how to represent numbers on the abacus. The abacus has various rods, each of them having five beads and a dividing bar between them. The beads on the lower part of the dividing bar each count a value of one when they're pushed up toward the bar. Otherwise, if they're away from the bar, they don't count any value. The bead above the bar counts a value of five when it's pushed toward the bar. Otherwise, away from the bar, it doesn't have any value. So with the abacus cleared, none of the beads are touching the bar. But when beads are touching the bar, they have a value corresponding to whether they're below or above the bar. So you can locate your place values on the abacus in any row that you wish based on the problem you're solving. But typically, on this kind of an abacus, this is a teaching abacus, it has a colored bead on the third rod uh, denoting the units column. So you could use this particular position if you're doing dollars and cents, for instance, because you have two columns here to the right of the units column. There's also a colored bead on the fourth row from the units column denoting the thousands. It's just a way of making it more convenient uh, for your notation. But let's go through and show how numbers are represented. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Now, beads are manipulated most efficiently using the Japanese Soroban with your thumb and index finger of your right hand. And the general rule is push down any bead using your index finger and push up any of the bottom beads with your thumb. Now, this teaching abacus is larger than a normal abacus, and so I actually have to brace it sometimes to move them like that. But a conventional abacus of normal size, you would just use your thumb and your index finger of your right hand. So now that we know how to represent numbers on the abacus, the next thing you need to know in order to do addition is the concept of complementary numbers. Because you don't always have the right number of beads on the rod to complete a number entry. So we have to do what's called a complementary operation. And what a complementary number is, is either a fives complement or a tens complement. And what that simply means is a fives complement, according to this table, is a number which, when added to the original number, equals five. So for instance, the fives complement of one is four, the fives complement of two is three, the fives complement of three is two, and the fives complement of four is one. Now the numbers 1 through 9 also have a tens complement, and they work the same way. They are the complementary number which added to the original number equals 10. So for instance, the tens complement of 1 is 9, 2 is 8, 3 is 7, 4 is 6, 5 is 5, etc. Those are complementary numbers, and you need to memorize or know the complements of all the numbers in order to do addition. When you're evaluating an addition problem, you want to ask yourself three different questions in a specific order, and there will be four answers total or four conditions possible, representing four different kinds of problems. So we're going to start with single digit problems. We'll be using this rod as our units rod, and we'll do a simple problem like one plus two. 
One is my starting number. Two is my add end or the number I'm adding to the starting number. So the first question you ask yourself is, can I directly enter the add end? Are there enough beads here? And the answer is yes. There are two additional beads there. The answer is three. Or let's say I have the problem of two plus six. Two is my starting number, six is my add end. Can I directly enter a value of six? And the answer is yes. A five bead and a one bead. And the answer is eight. So these kinds of problems represent the simplest kinds of problems where I can do direct addition of the number. But instead of that, let's say I have a problem like 3 plus 4. 3 is my starting number, 4 is my add end. So let me ask the first question again. Do I have 4 beads directly that I can push up? And the answer is no. So now I go to the second question, which is, are both the starting number and the add end less than 5? In this case, they are less than 5. 3 and 4 are both less than 5. So the rule is, if the answer is yes to that question, the rule is push down a 5 bead and push down the 5's complement of 4, of the add end. The 5's complement of 4 is 1. I push the 1 down. 3 plus 4 is 7. Now, the third type of problem is going to be using tens complements. So let's look at the problem of 8 plus 8. So again, we evaluate the problem in the same way as before. We ask the same questions in the same order. First of all, can I directly enter 8? The answer is no. Secondly, are both the starting number and the add end less than 5? The answer is no. Third question now, can I directly subtract the tens complement of the add end? Well, the add end is 8, the tens complement of 8 is 2. Yes, I can subtract the 2, and when I do that, I want to add a single bead on the next rod to the left, what I call a 10 bead, and the answer is 16. Now, the fourth possible conditions of addition problems is a problem like 6 plus 7. 6 is my starting number, 7 is my add end. I evaluate the problem with these same questions in the same order. Can I add 7 directly? The answer is no. I only have 3 beads left. Second question, are both numbers less than 5? No. Third question, can I directly subtract the tens complement of the add end? Well, the add end is 7, but I cannot directly subtract 3. I only have a single 1 bead. So in that case, this fourth possible condition of addition is I push the add end up, meaning my add end is 7. I push the 7, a 5 and a 2 bead, I push them up. Then I add my single bead, or my what I call the 10 bead, on the next rod to the left. 6 and 7 is 13. So in evaluating a problem, we ask these questions, these three questions, in the order we ask them in, in order to decide which of the four possible kinds of problems we have. The first type of problem being direct numerical entry, a problem like 2 plus 6, for instance. Right? I can directly enter the 6, no additional complication necessary. The next kind of problem is using both numbers less than 5, but I don't have enough 1 beads to add the second number. So a problem like 2 plus 4, right? So there's my starting number of 2. I don't have 4 beads left. So now both numbers are less than 5. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower the 5 and lower the 5's complement of 4, which is 1, and my answer is 6. The third possible condition or type of addition problem is involving tens complements. So a problem like, for instance, 8 plus 9, let's say. So I go through the same order of questions. Can I directly add the 9? No. Are both numbers less than 5? No. So now I ask the third question, can the tens complement of the 9 be directly subtracted, and yeah, the tens complement of 9 is 1, and when I do that, I have to add a single bead on the next column to the left. 9 and 8 is 17. 
And then the fourth possible type of problem that you can encounter is using both fives and tens complements. So a problem like seven plus six. My starting number is seven. Six is my add end. So can I directly add six? No. Are six and seven less than five? No. Can I directly subtract the tens complement of six, which is four? No. I only have two beads here, not four. In that case, the fourth possible condition here is I push the add end up meaning the add end is six, I just push six up, a five and a one, and then add the 10 bead, the single bead on the next column to the left. Answer is 13. So these are the four possible types of addition problems you will encounter. Now I want to talk about multi-digit numbers, numbers with more than one digit, and let's say something simple like 12 plus 14, the difference between abacus arithmetic and paper and pencil arithmetic is with the abacus we always add starting at the leftmost digit. And so we're going to add 14 to this, so I'm going to add my 1 here, and then I have to add the 4 here. And you'll notice this is a problem where I don't have 4 beads to directly add, so are both the 4 and the 2 less than 5? Yes, so I'm going to do Lower the 5 and subtract the 5's complement of 4, which is 1. Answer, 26. So the same rules that we use for single digit addition problems work for multiple column addition problems of any size. We add them from the leftmost to the rightmost. We treat each step like a separate single digit number. The only additional complication you will arise is when your next column to the left either has a 4 or a 9 in it. Let's look at that. So this is going to be a problem like 42 plus, let's say, 8. Can I directly add the 8? No. Are 2 and 8 both less than 5? No. Third question, can I subtract the tens complement of 8? Yes, that is 2. And now I have to add the single bead on the next column to the left, but you'll notice I don't have a single bead. So in the case of a 4 being here, I simply lower all the beads, and my answer is 50. The other complication, besides a 4 being on this next column to the left, is if a 9 is to the next column to the left. Let's look at the problem of 93 plus, let's say, 8. Okay, so we're going to add 8 to this column. Can we directly add 8 beads? No. Are both 3 and 8 less than 5? No. Can we subtract the tens complement of 8? Yes, that is 2. We subtract the 2. Now we need to add a single bead to the next column. It's, if it's a 9, you clear that column out and add the single bead on its next column to the left. Answer 101. And this principle with either a 4 or a 9 can work with numbers of any length. So for instance, let's say you had 4,996 and you want to add 7 to it. Okay, let's evaluate the problem. Do I have 7 beads directly that I can add? No. Are 6 and 7 both less than 5? No. The third question, can I subtract the tens complement of 7? directly? No. So therefore, I have to push 7 up, and now I have to add a 1. So I clear the 9s and move that down, because that's a 4. Answer, 5003. So these are two special cases of doing the tens carryover. If it's either a 4 or a 9, you have to do these special cases. Otherwise, it's a straightforward problem. So what I've just told you is everything you need to know to do addition problems of any length, any column size, any number of numbers. But you'll notice that going through these questions, these three questions to evaluate the problem to see which of the four possible states the problem is, can get laborious over time. But what actually happens in real life is when you start getting practice with this method, you soon recognize which state the problem is automatically without 
asking the four questions consciously. And the way you get to that condition is simply through rote practice. And the best way to do rote practice is to add up the numbers one through nine repeatedly. Now, this is a teaching abacus, and it only has seven rods or seven columns, so I can't actually add one through nine directly. But you can do this on your abacus with more than uh, 10 rods. You can add one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine to itself 10 times. On a smaller abacus like this, we can do it in groups of three, for instance. So I'm going to try one, two, three, and I'm going to add itself to itself 10 times. And if you're uh, astute enough, you'll probably recognize that if I do this properly, the number will be one, two, three, zero, right? I will essentially have multiplied it by 10. So let's go through this one, two, three, add it to itself 10 times. And as I do this, I'll start out by describing which of the four kinds of problems it is, okay? So one, direct number entry, two, direct entry, three, five's complement. One, direct entry, two, five's complement, three, direct entry. One, direct entry, two, direct, three is ten's complement. One, five's complement, two, ten's complement, three, five's complement. One is direct, two is direct, three is direct. One is direct, two is five's complement, three is ten's complement. One is direct, two is direct, three is direct. One, tens complement, two, tens complement, three, fives complement. One direct, two direct, three is tens complement. Answer is one, two, three, zero. That's adding one, two, three to itself ten times. Now on your larger abacus, with enough columns to do one through nine directly, when you do it 10 times in a row, you'll come across every possible combination of addition problems. And this gives you a great deal of practice. But I can do it, I can say in groups of three. Here we can do the seven, eight, nine rods. And I'm gonna add those to itself 10 times in a row. This time, I'm not gonna to describe to you each kind of problem, I'm just gonna do it directly. So seven, eight, nine, so seven, eight, Nine, 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 seven, eight. Nine, seven, eight, nine. Answer, seven, eight, nine, zero. That's how I know I got the answer right. And as you practice this sequence of problems over and over again, you will get very adept at doing it. You'll soon learn all the different combinations. But I would also recommend that you should vary up the order in which you do this, just so you don't get used to it. Like, for instance, you can add nine, eight, seven or add nine eight seven six five four three two one instead of one through nine do it in a different order just to make it varied so you you're not used to seeing the same numbers in the same order but this kind of a practice is what the Japanese Soroban experts do on a regular basis to keep their mind sharp. And as you do this, you'll soon recognize that you can see which one of the four possible types of addition problems you have automatically without having to consciously ask the four or the three questions over and over again. So besides doing these practice exercises to get adept at the Soroban, another thing you can do is if you come home from the store with a grocery list, a receipt from the store, sit down and add them up and see if you come up with the same subtotal that the store did. You should be able to. Using store receipts is another great way to get experience and practice on addition. But these kinds of paper problems, receipt lists, and these addition practice problems one through nine are great ways to stay exercised and 
efficient on the SOAR band? Well, everything I told you in this video is all you need to know to do any addition problem. You need to know how to enter numbers on the abacus. You need to know the fives and tens complements. And you need to know the three questions to interrogate a problem and the four possible states or conditions that those result in. Everything else is just practice. And again, getting an abacus, a Japanese soroban, and starting to do those practice exercises is essential to learning how to operate the abacus well. If you have adult size hands, try to get an abacus with slightly larger beads. And if you're a young person or a person with small fingers, then any, just about any abacus will work for you, any 1-4 style Japanese soroban. I hope this was instructive to you. If you have any questions, drop a note down below. I'd love to entertain your questions. And until next time, happy addition and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.